chapter 19. I feel excited. I've got a full 30 minutes to preach this morning. So in preacher's terms, that's about 45. Don't panic. It's okay. Amen. We've been in this series that I've titled The Gutter, and we've been talking about how God is pushing us into the world and how the, the world needs the church so much today. In this setup uh, today, I want to talk about uh, the idea of what God has been doing and how he's been doing it and why he's doing that in one simple phrase, and that is that uh, God loves the gutter. God loves the gutter. So often the things that we avoid, we tend to find God's presence. They are doing work, ministering, touching people. I don't know about you, but maybe, you, maybe you've noticed that sometimes where you think God isn't working, He often is. He's often there doing what he does because uh, the reason we don't see him or we don't think that God can be there working is because in our mind's eye, we, we have got a, a fixed way that God would work in people's lives and how God would do it. And so as we look today to the scripture, we look at Luke chapter 19, verse 1. I want to read a familiar portion of scripture to you. Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. You remember last Sunday I shared with you that Jesus has roots in Jericho. They go back a long way. Some 24th great grandmother from Jericho, Rahab, there. And I don't think it's coincidence. Maybe you might think it's coincidence. It's just happen chance that after all this time that Jesus would come to a place where it has roots. That those roots would be based in the gutter of that city. Rahab being a street dweller, a prostitute. And yet here is Jesus walking down those streets. And now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was chief tax collector. He was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but... Couldn't because of the crowd. He was a short, he was short in stature, is what the Bible says. So he ran ahead, climbed up into a tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I'm going to stay at your house. And he made haste. He came down and received him joyfully, but when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He's gone to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusations, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. And so, Father, bless the reading of the word to the hearing of our ear and the receiving of our heart. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? You know what I love when I love the Gospels? I love to see the beauty of the love of God for people. When I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I love reading through there and just seeing the beauty of God's love for people. And in this particular passage of Scripture, I want you to understand that nothing makes the gospel of Jesus Christ more beautiful than his love for every sinner. There's no one exempt. When we, when we, we see the gospel of Jesus Christ, we see it laid out in, in four very powerful, powerful writers as they share their life experience. What we see so beautifully shared there is the love of God for every sinner. Jesus said, I am, called to call, I am come to call the righteous, not the righteous, but the sinner to repentance. As Jesus preached, you'll notice in the gospel that the religious people were his worst enemies. 
As Jesus preached, you'll notice in the gospel that the sinners are the one who heard him and embraced him. The sinners who are the ones who flocked to him. As, as day after day, he made this pitch to an impoverished society that had been thrown away by the world, that had been neglected by the people around them. Jesus was there loving them. When they were unlovable, Jesus makes an appearance to love people. It's the beauty of the gospel. It's the way you see it. It's, it's the way it is. Yet so often the things in our life would tell us that we're unlovable by God. The things we've done, our past, our, our history, or the things we struggle with in our life, our attitudes, our thought processes, when we had a bad day, all of those things declare to us that we are not lovable. And that there's no way because of our shortcomings that God can love us. But the beauty of the gospel is this. Jesus loves every sinner. He came to negotiate a relationship with the least of us. What I love about Jesus is he goes to the gutter and he stays there. Now, the truth of the matter is, we have all experienced the gutter. We've all experienced the gutter. Ryan, maybe you can help me there. I'm not sure what happened to the PowerPoint. The gutter may not be the gutter to you. In other words, my gutter might not be your gutter. What I see as the gutter, you might not see as the gutter. We look at it very differently. We, we see it in very different ways. But let me just, you might want to write this down. You might want to jot it down. You might want to tweet it or Facebook it for those of, of those that you know aren't in church today that probably read your feed to give you a little conversation later. But here's the point I want to tell you this morning. I want you to get it. The gutter isn't just a poor man's venue. Oftentimes when we think about the gutter, we think about the poor, the drug addicted, uh, the homeless. We think about the, the lowest parts of society, the very dead end of, of, of the road. That's what we think about in it. When we think about the gutter, we think about the most dirty among us. But the truth of the matter is that the gutter is a place where disobedience comes to a dead end. That's what the, We've got this statement in our society. When people are, are struggling in their life, when they're making bad decisions, when they, when they refuse to do right, we make this statement, well, they'll change when they hit rock bottom. You ever made that statement? You ever thought that statement? Or oh, they haven't hit bottom yet. It's the same statement, only in the context of what Jesus is speaking to our heart. Let me tell you, let me give you a definition of the gutter. Forget about what you think it looks like. Forget about what, what, what facade you think covers it. The gutter is simply a place where disobedience has finally come to a dead end. And I think Zacchaeus' story is a perfect example of it. A New Testament story of redemption from the gutter of greed. Now watch this. The streets of Jericho, Rahab's home. This prostitute who is in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. There she is. All those years ago in Jericho. Now Jesus walking down those same streets. And it's full of business. Picture this in your mind. You can't just read the Bible like you've got to see it. It's, the Jericho in the streets are full of business. There is business going on and everything's happening. And there is Zacchaeus. He's right in the middle of it, cheating his own people. He's a tax collector. The Roman government would say, okay, we're requiring $100,000 worth of taxes from this area. You're in charge, Zacchaeus, of collecting the taxes. Whatever you collect above $100,000 is yours. So if you collect $200,000, you keep $100,000. We'll take $100,000. That's all we require of you. And so the reason that people hated tax collectors is because they knew tax collectors always overcharged them. They never knew what their taxes really were. But they knew they were being cheated. And so here is Zacchaeus. When a crowd is happening, right? He, he would be there and people would avoid him at all cost. 
Come on now, if you were to see a guy uh, from the IRS with a big old uh, uh, tag on, uh, uh, you know, a uh, sticker on his shirt that says, I'm from, you'd avoid them too. I'm from the IRS. You'd go down the other aisle in the grocery store. I'm going to talk to that person. I'm from the IRS. To be avoided. But you better believe. Everyone knew his intentions. When Zacchaeus showed up, he was going to have his hands in everybody's pocket. And so, guess what? Every time there's a large crowd in town, he's got to make sure he's there looking for someone to cheat. Who haven't I talked to? Who owes taxes yet? And so, naturally, the rumors of Jesus and his miracles had spread far and wide. And everywhere Jesus would go, there'd be great crowds because people were being healed and delivered and set free. Demons were being cast out. And so, everybody would flock around Jesus. And so, Zacchaeus hears the parade is coming. Jesus is coming. Ah, I've got to be there. There's going to be a crowd there. Maybe Jesus even owes some taxes. I need to have a talk with him. I'm going to talk with Jesus. After all, he's got this big ministry. Probably money flowing everywhere. Come on, somebody. Because that's why we're all in ministry is for the money. This crowd's got to be good for a few bucks. The problem is the crowd was so big and he was so short, he couldn't see Jesus. Like, every time we think about this story, we only think about it in children's Bible story terms. Like, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. I mean, how, how wee is we? I don't know. Like, all of a sudden, we go from King James to French. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. I don't... How does this work? I don't... Anyway... The Bible doesn't say how small he was. The important thing to notice that there's a big crowd. He can't see Jesus because the crowd is so big. And he, he's not a very tall fella. And maybe he's like Matt Stutzman or something. Matt's not here today, so I can pick on him. Maybe he's like David Campbell. Think about it. You ever thought about why this story's in the gospel? Especially Luke's. Luke's the physician, the Gentile physician. Luke's got to write in his gospel about the miracles, the healing miracles of Jesus, because as people would read that, they would believe it because he was a physician. He, his testimony would be believable because he would know if someone was really sick and, and had gotten healed. He would, he would be able to testify, and people would believe his testimony. And so when you read the gospel of Luke, you see a lot of healing miracles in there because his testimony is so powerful that people was like, he's a physician. He would know what he's talking about. There's nobody getting healed in this story. Why is Luke putting this story in his gospel? Think about it. I'm sure in my mind, I am sure, I can't prove it, but I'm sure that Zacchaeus wasn't the first person to climb a tree to see Jesus. I'm sure of it. I'm sure that as Jesus walked down the streets of cities that people would climb trees to get a good look. I'm sure that as Jesus walked down the streets that people would be on the rooftops of houses looking down to see him. I'm sure Zacchaeus is not the only guy who ever climbed a tree to see Jesus. Why did Luke of all people put this in his gospel? Here's a lost person trying to get a good angle on the Savior. Think about this. Luke's a Gentile. He's not a Jew. Why wouldn't he write about a man who because of his reputation or the way he looked or where he was from couldn't get to Jesus? Why wouldn't that story be in Luke's gospel? He understands what it's like to not be able to get to Jesus because of a past. 
He understands what it's like to be alienated because of something that's going on in your life or because of who you are or where you're from or what you look like. He understands this above anybody else. And I wonder how many times it happens today that someone is denied because of the way they look or their emotional state or their spiritual baggage that they carry. How many times does the church turn people away because they don't dress properly or they don't talk right or they don't look like us or they don't speak our language? Amen. Or they're not from the right side of the tracks like we are. How many times are people denied to see Jesus because of their reputation or their past? That drug addict, when you get off drugs, we'll talk to you about Jesus. That divorcee, and you get this fixed, then God will love you again. Other than that, you're pretty broken. Come on, somebody. That single mom. When you get this right, there's no sin in being a single mom. Where is that in this scripture? When you dress right. Tim told us a story about a church that moved into a town and someone said, well, so what's the purpose of your church? And they said, well, we're looking for people who qualify for membership. In other words, we're going to deny everybody who doesn't qualify for our standards of membership the right to see Jesus. How many times does it happen, church? Where is it at, right? Listen, uh, have my reactions or actions ever prevented hurting people from getting a clear glimpse of Jesus? Has my attitude, have the sermons I've preached, have the things that I've taught, have the ministry that I've done, all my life, has it ever, ever hindered anybody from getting a glimpse of of Jesus? My hypocrisy causing an unbeliever not to see Jesus. My making the gospel more complicated than what it is. My absence from the gutter that they live in because I don't want to get dirty. Zacchaeus was desperate to see Jesus that day. Who cares what his motives were? Who cares? Oh, he was there just to collect money. Who cares how I get people in the room with Jesus? Who cares? Who cares what people's motives are for coming to church? Who cares for people what people's motives are for wanting to hear about Jesus? Who cares? Don't talk to that Muslim. They're just going to make fun of you. About you worshiping Jesus. Who cares how I get people in a room with Jesus? Because this is one thing I know. That when people have been in the presence of Jesus, they have never, ever, ever left the same as they came. They will be impacted for all eternity. Amen. That's my job. I don't care what people look like. I don't care where they come from. I don't care about the color of their skin. I don't care what language they speak. Come on, church. I don't want any of my actions to ever prevent someone from coming to Jesus. And Renee getting blasted for speaking a different language. Can you imagine the idiocy of someone making fun of her because she's more educated than they are. She speaks four languages and you can't even speak the one you speak properly. How about this? When we get to heaven, we'll be surprised, amen, at how many languages are spoken in heaven. It says every nation and every tongue. I've learned to celebrate it. When I go to the Dominican or Nicaragua, or we go, you know, uh, to Brazil, and, and we go to a worship, I can't understand a thing those people are saying, what they're singing. But the presence of God is there. And I do understand that. And that's all I care about. Who cares why people are there? If they're desperate to see Jesus, I want to get there. He's so desperate that his prestige as a tax collector, he's willing to look undignified and climb a tree. As Jesus and this crowd begin to approach, this gutter intervention takes place. And painted on Zacchaeus' heart is the love of Christ. You ever watch those shows, Intervention? I know some of y'all watch those. I've watched a few of them. People step in to save their family or their loved ones. Here's an intervention happening. 
Now, don't run by it so fast. No doubt this very day, there were people on the rooftops watching Jesus as he walked by. No doubt this very day, there were people in the trees along the street watching Jesus walk by. There may have been people in the very tree Zacchaeus was in. But for some reason, I have no idea why, the Bible doesn't say why, Jesus stops. And he looks up this tree, and what he says is, Hey, you sinner, you cheater, you low-life, disgusting individual, get out of that tree. It's not what he says. That's not the way Jesus addresses people he loves. He looks at the tree and he speaks to the heart of a man and he calls him by his first name. Never met him before. Listen, when you've never met someone and they call you by your first name, you get a little, whoa, what did I miss here? I mean, I bet Zacchaeus about fell out the tree. Zacchaeus, whoa, ain't nobody up here named Zacchaeus but me. Get out of that tree. And her up. Do you see? I mean, Jesus must have been hungry or something because he's, like, you know, people invite themselves over to your house for dinner, right? It's one thing if people invite themselves over to your house for dinner. It's another thing for them to do that and tell you what they want to eat. Coming to dinner, I'd like, uh, you know, ribeye. It'll be good. Eddie, I'll be over. Okay. A little Brazilian salt. Be all right. Zacchaeus, I mean, he's got to startle him. He called him by his name. See, I grew up in the South, and, and, and just out of honor and respect, you, you did not call someone by their first name if you didn't have a personal relationship with them. You didn't. It was always Mr. Lima. It, was, it would always be Mr. Detweiler. It would always be Miss Munson. You would do that. You got popped if you didn't. It's the way you did it. But when you developed a personal relationship with them, then you, you got to speak their, their first name. It, it drawed a little depth to that. And so here is Jesus. He's speaking this man's name. He didn't call him a sinner. He stopped for so, for, for so reason, and he called this sinner by name. I, the Bible doesn't record a gasp, but I can hear it in the crowd. Jesus stops. Hey, Zacchaeus. And everybody goes, <gasps> We've been looking for him. There he was, hiding. He's hiding in a tree ready to pounce on somebody for money. And Jesus found him. And he called him by name. We, we don't want to speak to him. And Jesus calls him by his first name. Does he know who that is? He's a cheat. He's a, he's a lowlife. He, he's a nobody. He, he, he robs from us. He steals. He, he brings suffering on us. He, he's, 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 he's no good. And then Jesus says, hey, get out of that tree and hurry up. We're going to your house. And like a squirrel running down a tree, Zacchaeus comes out of that tree. Can you see him? And they say, he's gone to be a guest of a sinner. What is Jesus doing? Like they want answers, but they got a lesson. It's called the gutter 101. Sinners, tax collectors, churchgoers, pastors, pew sitters, pimps, broken, abandoned. Jesus makes it very clear. What his and our mission on earth has to be. And that is to get in the gutter and provide hope, church. That's our job. That's our mission. Even when the gutter's up a tree and over our heads, it's still our mission. I said, even when the gutter's up a tree and over our heads. Sometimes we don't get involved with things because we think it's too big for us. It's over our heads. And all Jesus calls us to do is love people. Notice this, something. Every time Jesus turned towards the gutter, the gutter turned towards him. 
And two seconds flat, Zacchaeus realized where his life had gone wrong. And he said, if I've stolen anything, if I've taken any, I'm going to give it back. Half my goods are going to the poor, and I'll restore everything else fourfold. You know what I love about this story? Is Jesus reached into Zacchaeus' gutter, and in turn, Zacchaeus reached out to Jesus. You see, don't hesitate to reach into the gutter. With the love of Jesus. People will reach out. People will reach back. That's, that's our job. That's our calling. He spoke. And, and this you got to be sure that this crowd was listening. You know how I mean, Jesus just kind of does? You ever just tried to put, you ever just looked at somebody and said, watch me push this buttons. Push, watch me push their buttons. You ever just looked at somebody and said, said watch this, I'm going to go over here and push Eddie's button. Right? I remember Dan King, Dan, we could, man, we love Dan King, great man, great friend, and, and just, uh, I remember some, down in Topeka, one guy threatened me on the softball field, I was, and, and Dan was the only guy on the whole team that came over to my rescue, and Dan's like, congratulations, man, you're an idiot, you just threatened the pastor, and uh, so I, I just felt, you know, yeah, Dan's, a, that's right, Dan's on my side. And this guy was just, man, he was really a bad guy all night long. He'd just been, I don't know where he came from, but he, he did need Jesus. And uh, later on, he was over in our dugout. Dan's running him out of the dugout with a baseball, a softball bat. Get out of our dugout. I love Dan. And, but Dan was so easy to mess with. And like as a, base, as a softball team, we, we'd just get around and go, watch me go mess with Dan. And, and so, you know, Dan, uh, uh, Rachel was about to have the, their first baby. And, and, you know, Dan, is, he's, 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 a, he's got a strict budget, and he saves his money. He doesn't waste his money like he spent. I remember he bought some tools, uh, and he said, man, i got to buy these tools before I get married. And it was incredible. That's just the way Dan was, right? And so we would all mess with Dan at the ballgame. We'd be like, Dan, how's Rachel doing? Oh, she's great, man. You know, pregnancy's going okay and, and all that. And then we'd just say, you know how much diapers cost, man? And then Dan would be like, oh. You know, are you ready? You've been saving for diapers? Like, people talk all the time, Dan, about saving for college, but diapers cost way more than college, Dan. And so it would just, man, it would mess with him, and he would just be like, oh, can't take it. And we would just mess with him all the time. Have you ever just looked at somebody and said, watch me go push this person button? That's what Jesus was doing. He did it all the time. He spoke loud enough the whole crowd could hear him. Watch what he's doing here. Today, salvation has come to your house because the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's love, church. When someone's willing to take a risk and love the unlovable, when someone's willing to take a risk and love the unwanted, who cares what the assumption and the opinions of other people are around us? The love of Christ is simple. Love the unloved and love the unwanted. Let me close with this thought. The unconditional love of God is the only love that works in the gutter. We need to get that in our spirit. When something as pure as the love of God is the most profound thing and the lowest of dwelling places, you know it's important. Why? Why is the love of God so profound in the lowest of places. I mean, it's something we take for granted. Those of us who have been raised out of the gutter and put on solid ground, and we take it for granted. But if you go to the lowest places and the darkest places, the love of God is so profound that God would love me. Let me tell you why. Because where darkness abounds, the love of God is brighter and brighter. Ministry in the gutter always confuses the religious. It's not the type of outreach we teach in Bible college. The religious often stand on the sideline and are critical of ministries that don't fit into their box. Pastor Don, we are so disappointed in your ministry because we saw a video where you invited a man to come to church. He says he drinks a beer. Brian says, why don't you come to church? Well, I like to drink a beer every once in a while. And 
Ryan says, I'd rather you drink a beer and come to church than drink a beer and not come to church. And I get this lecture. I was so angry. I just gave a lecture back. The Pharisees always missed what Jesus was doing. We weren't promoting drinking. We were promoting coming to church. We were promoting getting people in the room with Jesus. We were promoting letting Jesus work out the kinks in people's lives, not mine. No, I can't work the kinks out in your life. Not my job. My job is to teach you how to sit at the feet of Jesus, to teach you how to hear from Jesus, to teach you to love Jesus, to teach you to want to be in his presence. When you learn to do those things, Jesus will work out the kinks. Now, people ask me my opinion about stuff. Don't get mad at me when I tell you. If you want to know, I don't think one drop of alcohol has ever done this world any good. But I can march you across the street and show you life after life who's been ruined by it. So now that you asked, now you know. Scripture says that strong drink makes a fool of a man. My family, my parents both suffer to this day because of foolishness. They would admit it. Jesus never did fit in people's box. Let me share this with you. A hay field, smelly barn, and two pieces of old lumber on the side of a garbage dump. How can that ever produce the Savior of the world? Let me say that again. A hayfield, smelly barn. And years later, two pieces of wood stuck in the ground on the side of a garbage dump. How could the Messiah ever come from those two things? You see, the gutter simply doesn't fit in our religious box. Story after story in the Bible and throughout all history proves to us that God has always been involved in taking his love to the gutter to the point of sending his son in order to create a bridge for mankind to get back to him. Jesus going to the gutter brought back an unfaithful creation that had sold themselves to the streets of unfaithfulness. Think about this. Listen to me very carefully. I'm unfaithful. You're unfaithful. We're all unfaithful. Everything we choose, every time we choose, our own agenda is over his. Choosing to live in the gutter instead of rescuing people from the gutter. It makes me an unfaithful partner with God. Choosing those things looking at the gutter and saying, I'm sanitized now. If I go back, I'll get dirty. Listen, I don't know why we act like sin will ever stain God. The deepest, darkest, dirtiest gutter on the face of the earth cannot make God dirty. Do we understand that? But we act like some people around us could, and so we have to protect God from those people. Why do we do that? God doesn't need our protecting. God needs our partnership. God's calling us back. The good news is, you want some good news? How many of you want some good news? The Bible insists over and over and over on the mercy of God. God is always waiting for us to admit that we missed the mark. And then when I make it right with him, he's always ready to clean my slate. Bingo every time. I missed it, God. How can I escape the gutter? It doesn't make any sense to only be encouraged to go back. I don't want to go there. I, I came from there. I, I, I've been cleansed from that. I might get dirty again. God says, I want you to go back this time with a desire to help people who are still living there. All of us have those neighbors, those friends, those families, those co-workers, those acquaintances. Who's your friend? Remember that sermon? Friends, relatives, acquaintances, and neighbors. Everybody's got a friend. 
friends, relatives, acquaintances, and neighbors. Everybody's got one. Who's your friend that's living in the gutter? You see, because God loves me and call, what he did is he caused me to see, even though I was living in the gutter, I belonged with him. That's all I want to show people. My goal is not to show people the deepest theological arguments about God. Listen, do you know what theology is? And, and, I, I, and I'm, I'm, I try to be as theologically correct as I possibly can in everything as I learn more and more about it. Theology is just the study of God. You, you, can, you can be a non-believer and be a theologian. You study about God all you want. I'm interested in bringing people into the same room with Jesus and letting him work their kinks out. You see, the truth is, all those years ago in Chipley, Florida, God came looking for me. I didn't belong in the gutter. That's where I was. And I learned that unfaithful people who are desperate for the love and mercy of God will always find it. They will. My wife and myself and my family were so blessed that a church just loved us. They just loved us. They just said, Jesus, you work on him because... God is a God who loves the gutter. Will you stand with me? And he wants us to do the same. You know that street. You know that house. You know that family who doesn't know Jesus. You know those kids who would probably come to church if someone would pick them up and bring them. You know those people who would do well if you just sit down and say, you know what, I'm not really here to invite you to church. I'm just here to tell you that God hasn't forgotten you and Jesus loves you. And let's let Jesus be Jesus in the midst of it all. You know, the journey to the gutter, it pays great rewards in the form of transformed lives. And we've just got to, we've just got to get there. Right? Think about Zacchaeus. What an amazing story. It's not just a children's Bible story about a wee little man. Oh, well, from this area, Vern Troyer's from here, right? We think about Zacchaeus, we think about Vern, right? A little, little Vern. Yeah. Mini me. Can you see Vern climbing a tree looking for Jesus? I, I, I hope to. I hope to. Right? I, I would love to be there the day when Jesus shows up and says, Hey, Vern, I'm going to your house. Come on. I mean, that's, we can believe it. Father, we love you. We're so excited about your plan for us as a church and how you call us to minister. Lord Jesus, only you could give us the strength and the ability to do it. I pray that over our church, God, that as we go from this place, that we go into the gutter and that all we want to do is tell people about your great love. Father, we pray that our reward will be souls. That's it. Give us souls for our hire, Lord. Let that be our wages, that people's lives are transformed for your glory and your honor. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise.